Today on our show, we have Carl Safina, esteemed author, ecologist, environmental activist, conservationist, multi-prize winner. He's got his best-selling book, which we'll be talking about today, Beyond Words, which is really fabulous. And I've had the opportunity to hear Carl speak about it and read from it. And of course, I've read it. And everyone I know who's reading it absolutely loves it. He's also given a fantastic TED Talk. Highly recommend that you watch. So I wanted to just welcome you, Carl. It's really great to have you today. Well, thank you. Um, so tell us about how you got to this. I know you, you were originally working on oceans. You have a number of books on oceans and ocean conservation and fish. Right. So I'd love to hear about the journey to, to this book. Uh, well, I love nature and I love animals. And for a long time, I worked on ocean issues just as my particular focus, although the ocean is a gigantic set of topics. But um, I didn't want to keep repeating myself. I, I was afraid that if I wrote another ocean-oriented book, I'd start saying some of the same things. So I circled back to my original interest from when I was a child, which is what do animals do and why do they do it? And what might they be experiencing? So it wasn't like I went from one thing to the next mm -hmm. thing to the next thing and then that got me to this. It's that this is a return to really a deeper, more original interest of mine. So kind of circling back. Yes, very much so. That's, that's great. So, and I know you have lots of animals in your home. We have a few. We have two dogs, a couple of little parrots that we kind of rescued, and uh, a snake and two chickens. That's what we have right now. And isn't there a squirrel that who comes there, to visit? There was a squirrel, and she became completely independent. We, we found her as a starving little orphan baby squirrel mm. crawling around in the middle of a parking lot. And uh, we couldn't see where she might have come from. And we raised her. And, uh, and then we did what, what I call a, well, not just I, it's called a soft release, where you, you don't just raise them to a certain point and then bring them someplace and open the cage. You let them come and go and okay. come. So she was coming and going for about 14 months. But she got pretty independent. She was living somewhere back in the woods. I once followed her pretty far back in the woods to a particular tree, and then I think she changed houses. And uh, anyway, it was a great experience. Yeah, it looks wonderful. I follow some of those posts on Facebook where uh -huh. the animals are releasing. Yeah. I, love, I love looking at them. So I, I'm really interested in, in, in this notion you have here about um, a question that you talk about where it's not how are animals like us, but kind of looking at the animal for its, in its own Yes. Concept, who, who that right. animal is in, on their, in their own right. Yes. It's almost impossible for people to get away from focusing only on us. Even with animals, we say, well, how are they like us? If we consider what our dog might be feeling, we say, does, does my dog love me? It always comes back to us. We're incredibly focused on ourselves. We are. And we miss everything else about who is in the here, here with us in the world. So... It's not about how are they like us. It's like who are they like us or not? Who who are we here with? And uh, I wanted to get to know them better. And what did you find? What are some of the most interesting well, things you I, found in that Ironically, journey? one of the things that is inescapable is that in many ways they are like us in the fact that, you know, we are all related and we are all kin and uh, they all vertebrate animals have essentially the same skeleton. Right. Most vertebrate classes have exactly the same bones. Um, even animals with flippers, they have the same hand in that flipper and the same organs, the same central nervous system with a brain that has many of the same components and the same hormones that create mood and motivation in our brains. They have the exact same hormones. So there are those similarities. And then there are other things where they are different. Many of them, their social structure is different. We live in nuclear families. We have like the two breeders, the mom and dad, right. and the children. And then when the children get to be, um, you know, in their late adolescence, they start leaving to try to get their own stake in the world. And Wolves are exactly like that, and wolves live in nuclear families, and dogs are descended from wolves. That's why dogs live in our families as well as they do. It comes very naturally to them. Elephants live differently. Even elephant, the female 
family group is the basic unit of elephant society. The males kind of wander around, and the, the mother and her sisters and, her, and all their female children stay together for their entire lives. And the males, when they get to be adolescents, they go out and join male groups that are loose. They're not as tight. The female families are really tight. With killer whales, the, f the children never leave their mother. Male and female children stay with their mother for her entire life, and wow. they never leave, and then, they, and then they stay together. They don't go out anywhere else. Chimpanzees are very different. They live in a group that's kind of like a tribe without, uh, without having, uh, you know, like family units within the tribe. Mm -hmm. it, um, so there, so those are some of the differences, and those, and you know, and I'm just talking about some of the mammals here. There, are, birds do different things in different ways, and some right. birds have lifelong bonds, and some are, most birds are monogamous, pretty much. Some are not. Uh, there's a huge variety, and that's one of the, you know, one of the most fantastic things is that, uh, you know, in a lifetime of intense study, you can barely nick the surface of everything that's here around us. It's just, uh, you know, it's beautiful, it's fantastic, it's fascinating, it's beyond ancient, you know, where we come from and who we are related to here. So what are some of the biggest surprises that you had in writing this book? The individual lives of some of the animals, I mean, a lot of the book is focused on actual individual free-living animals that some scientists have known for a very long time. In the case of two of the three groups in the book, the elephants and the killer whales, they, they can live to be um, easily into their 60s. Killer whales right. can live to be 100 or a little more. And there are scientists uh, who are in the book, two scientists who have been studying them for 40 years, and they've known individual mm. elephants, mm. individual elephant families, individual killer whale groups for 40 years. They know the individuals. They've watched them grow up. They know who their mothers and who their children are. And, and uh, you know, that those details are really very eye-opening when you start to look at it. Mm -hmm. And the, the third animal that I focus on is wolves. And um, I was spending a lot of time with a person who has watched wolves in a particular place every single day for 15 years without any break. He's never missed a day in 15 years. That's extraordinary. It's super extraordinary. There's not, I've, I, I don't know of anything like that or anyone like him. And he's watched these wolves through several generations and he can tell you stories about who they were, who they came from, who they are, what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I saw things happening to them. I saw what happened when a couple of them were shot, what happens to the rest of the family, the turmoil that all of mm -hmm. that causes and the, the total dislocation and, uh, and social chaos in mm -hmm. the family when the adults um, are killed by people. So, and that was while you were there. The adults had been killed right before I got there, but I saw a lot of that turmoil um, unfolding. And one, one of the adults was not killed. There were two brothers uh -huh. and, uh, and the, the mother, the, the adult female. Mm -hmm. So one of the brothers and the female were killed. And the, the remaining adult male, um, he lost everything. He lost his hunting territory. He lost his family. He, he was wandering around, um, and it took him three years to find another mate and have pups again. His life completely unraveled, and I also saw the, f the family kicked out one of their sisters, and this has been a totally stable family with no internal strife at all. Mm -hmm. They seemed to be jealous of her, and they kicked her out. That I watched happening. I watched her trying to come back to her family for days, and. They wouldn't let her. She wound up getting shot at somebody's chicken coop because she was starving because her family is her hunting support. You know, they all hunt together and they need each other to, to, uh, to get the food that they eat. That's incredible. It's an incredible it, story. It, it is incredible. Uh, that's, this is the way the world actually works. So one of the main things that, that is surprising um, that I really realized in writing this book is how limited human beings and human minds are. And uh, the way the world is and the way all these other animals are, we have no acquaintance with. So we hear these stories and we say, oh my God, that's incredible. 
That's how they've, that's who they've been for, right. for tens of millions of years, since way before there were people. Mm. That's how they've been and that's who they've been. And then, you know, we get a few stories because somebody has finally bothered to watch. Mm. And we say, oh, that's incredible. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, I never imagined. Well, it's been there. It's so important what you're saying. There's a term we use in my class all the time, which is you know, anthropocentric. I'm sure you use it in yours too in your work. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to really speak to maybe why we have so many problems environmentally. It's, it's part of why we have so many problems that we only think of ourselves. But the main reason we have so many problems is, is also because we don't think of the consequences of our actions. We, we think that we are as smart as can be. And it's very obvious to me that we're not because we make incredible mistakes. We, we mess up incredibly. And we can see from other animals that some are more clever, you know, or smarter in terms of solving problems than, than others. And as far as technology, humans are the smartest. But if you can look at different species and say, well, this one doesn't make tools at all and isn't good at solving problems. This one makes a few simple tools and is very good at solving problems. This one is, th these, these ravens and these certain parrots, they can solve puzzles better than dogs can. Uh, you, you see that there's a range of intelligence and then there are people. People have uh, a lot of cleverness about technology. There doesn't seem to be any end to how clever we could be about inventing stuff. But what that range tells you is that we're probably not as smart as it could be possible to be. So if the smartest human has, an, let's just say an IQ, is a fairly artificial thing, but it means something, of a high IQ of 160, what would an IQ of 500 be like? Mm. What would people be like if we could live 2,000 years and be really saddled with the consequences of making a gigantic mess. We, mm -hmm. we live, you know, if we were uh, certain kinds of insects or mice or something like that, we might live a year or we might live two or three years. Mm -hmm. We live, you know, 60 or 70 or 80 years. So we understand that if you make a big mess, that's going to be a problem for you in the next few years. Probably don't do that. But we don't understand that if you make a big mess, that's going to be a problem a century from now or 200 years from now, mm -hmm. we think, well, why bother to worry about it? We, it's not our problem. And so our lifespan is part of the limit of how we think about things. And I just think that we're, there's, a, there's an obvious limit to our intelligence, our ability to think about the consequences of what we're doing, to care about who we are hurting mm -hmm. with those consequences. So, you know, dogs can do certain things and they can't do other things and people can do certain things and we seem incapable of doing other things. Right. But that's a problem. It is a problem. And that, uh, that thing of not seeing forward is really important with things like climate change and contamination and ocean pollution and trash and all these, these, these right. issues that we're facing today, which are huge. Yes. Um, so if you were to say, because we only have a few more minutes, unfortunately, <laughs> I could talk to you for hours, mm -hmm. um, if you, were, if you were to say, w what do the animals have to teach us about the mistakes we're making, uh, what would that be? Well, they live in a way that is compatible with the rest of the world, and we live in a way that is not compatible with the living world. Probably every species of living thing mm -hmm. is at its lowest population level in the history of our existence anyway, mm -hmm. because of us. We, we kill things off, we take incredibly rich landscapes and we slick them off and we maybe we grow one crop and then we pollute the air and then we pollute the water. Mm. And we're the only species that is not really compatible with the continuity of life. Mm -hmm. And if this is where we've gotten in only 200 years of the Industrial Revolution, which is really where these big problems have started to really accelerate, mm -hmm. you know, could this even last another few centuries? Or what would it be like in 5,000 years? Is there any possibility that any other large species will be in the world with us? 
we can look to these creatures and say, you know, elephants live in these incredibly peaceful, supportive families. They really mean a lot to mm. each other. Killer whales really mean a lot to each other. Wolves really mean a lot to each other, just like dogs mean a lot to each other and, and include us in that grouping. It's, it's possible to be, uh, you know, to live a much more peaceful existence in the world and not be in such constant uh, conflict with everything. And I think that that's the big, the big thing that we could get is to, is to hit a little reset button in our opinion of ourselves and say, you know, there's very, very good things about people and there's really very troubling things about people. In theory, we should be able to keep the good things and stop the bad things, but we're not anywhere near doing that. Mostly we don't think about it enough. That's absolutely true. And that's why books like yours are so important and the work you're doing is so important. I can imagine, as I'm listening to you talk, how heartbreaking it must have been at times to be with elephants and know that there's so few of them left and lions are going extinct. And you Yeah, know, and well, all of that is true, but um, I'm in no position to indulge in those feelings because uh, I'm not the one that is suffering the fear and the violence that they are living through. Right. Um, I'm not the incredibly, incredibly poor people who live there who have to kill an elephant for a few dollars because they have nothing else that they could possibly do and they have hungry families right. and, uh, you know, they're up against it completely. And um, I live a great great life. So if it's heartbreaking to me, so what? You know, I should just get over it and move on and keep trying to work on these things. And to help. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm with you on that. That's yeah. absolutely right. And, the, and the, there's so much poverty in the world and a lot of environmental justice associated with the depletion of species, as we know. Yes. So helping people is really important, too. Right. Creating community. Jane Goodall's doing that. And exactly. Pat yeah. Wright's doing that. And right. Well, I want to thank you again. And, oh, thank you, Heidi. Um, I just want to hold this fantastic book up. Everyone really should read this book. Thank you. Uh, it's so important in all of your work. And you've got an incredible site at you know, the Safina Center. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend people go there and, and look at your site and read up on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, important work on ocean preservation, uh, what fish to eat, what fish not to eat, um, how right. to be more mindful. I use this with my students. And we, we, many people just don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't realize when they're eating that piece of fish in the restaurant what that yeah, means right. to that species of fish. So, right. so, so Carl Safina's that, site. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Right. <laughs> well, that go to safinacenter.org. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming. Really thank great you. having you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So it was really wonderful today. Um, just honored to have um, Carl Safina here, author, ecologist, conservationist, and wonderful writer and wonderful activist uh, taking care of our planet. Thank you so much and share this video with others and come back for more. Bye-bye.